The following review for Metal Gear Rising Revengeance includes spoilers for the entire game, and by extension Metal Gear Solid 2 and 4. If you haven't played this game then you might want to give it a go before watching the rest of this video. Metal Gear Rising Revengeance released recently for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. The game ditches many of the usual Metal Gear trappings and this time around development was handled by Platinum Games instead of Kojima Productions. Players take on the role of Raiden, a cyborg ninja as he hunts down members of Desperado Enforcement. Everything starts out innocently enough with Raiden on the security detail for an African politician. They talk back and forth a little to establish the setting and their relationship before the job goes horribly wrong and Raiden is forced into service. This is the tutorial stage which handles the introduction of the basic details very well. There's some punching bag enemies to get the player acclimated, but this only lasts for less than 5 minutes before Revengeance shows its true colours. As somebody who's played a lot of games, one of the parts I most dread about booting up a new title is the tutorial. There's always some boring introductory sequence where the bare essentials of gameplay are introduced, and then usually new stuff is doled out in chunks over the next hour or so. It often feels like I'm being held back because the designers want to account for people who have absolutely never played a computer game before. Raiden's previous game was MGS2, so Revengeance takes the second last boss from that game, supercharges it, and throws it at the player 5 minutes in. For an action game like Revengeance, this is the way the tutorial should be, 5 minutes in and you're playing the game you paid money for. Revengeance manages to have this extremely entertaining introduction even though some of the gameplay elements have yet to be introduced. Raiden doesn't have his Zandatsu maneuver yet, and the player is never expected to parry during any of this, so it's not accomplishing this simply by dropping the player in at the deep end, it does stagger its mechanics somewhat. The focus this time is on action, and the early boss fight helps to establish this along with grabbing the player's attention. It sets the stage for the ridiculously over the top acrobatics to follow, and makes for an incredibly satisfying intro to the game even on repeat playthroughs. The tactics for this boss are rather simple, it's mostly a case of using the ninja run to avoid attacks and hack away whenever it sits still. Although it's not complicated, one thing this boss showcases very well, perhaps better than any of the other bosses in the game, is the way Revengeance uses its boss music. The soundtrack is very different from other Metal Gear titles, after all this is MGR, not MGS. The fights are accompanied by a metal soundtrack with a heavy emphasis on guitars and fast tempos. It's not the type of thing I'd listen to in my spare time normally, but I have to say it integrates amazingly well in this game, and much of it has to do with the way the soundtrack is programmed into the boss fights. When a new phase of a fight kicks in, or when Raiden is expected to go into blade mode and start hacking away, this will often be accompanied by a shift in the game's music, and climactic moments towards the end of the fights are often accompanied with lyrics matching up to the situation somewhat. Stop that play. To say this makes the boss fights more satisfying would be an understatement. Judging by the number of programmers assigned to this stuff, you can tell the team took it very seriously, and it's really paid off. The music shifts naturally from one phase to another, usually lining up with the action seamlessly. The way it builds up over the course of each boss fight infuses the scene with an incredible amount of energy, and even tension. Of all the things Revengeance does well, the music during the fights is the one thing I would love to see other games take a lesson from. Once Metal Gear Ray is put down, the introductory sequence ends with Raiden being left near death by enemy PMC Desperado Enforcement. This causes him to seek revenge vengeance and the rest of the game sees Raiden trying to track down Desperado in order to get payback for his mission gone wrong. He returns with an improved cyborg body which allows him to perform the Zandatsu move, which is Japanese for cut and take. Raiden cuts people open and takes out their spines to restore his energy. It's incredibly brutal, but I have to admit it's also incredibly satisfying as a result. The level of violence here is off the charts, but that's part of the charm of the game, and the animation is so satisfying to watch that I never tired of it no matter how many times I saw it. <laughs> 
Although the introductory sequence was handled incredibly well, the game really drops the ball when it attempts to introduce the player to parrying. Boris explains it to the player like this. To parry incoming hits, throw out your own barrage of light attacks while your foe is on the offensive. Unfortunately, I found this to be pretty misleading and it left me confused for quite a while. Getting ready for a parry is totally separate from performing an attack. They both happen to use the square button, but the analog stick is the key. It needs to be pressed forward at the same time as the attack button in order to parry. This is something I would never do when just throwing out a series of attacks. I assumed I just had to attack at the correct time to make it work, so I was confused about this for a while. On my first go around I played on normal mode without using any healing items, and the limited health forced me to learn the ins and outs of the controls to get past the bosses. But I can imagine many players on normal or easy would never figure this out, and might think the parry system is terrible for the whole game, when really it just wasn't explained properly. It's funny how damaging such a simple miswording can be. Even after getting used to the parry system, I'm not sure I like the decision to make it directional by incorporating the analog stick. This can cause problems because the camera isn't very intelligent sometimes, which makes it hard to judge what direction needs to be pressed in order to correctly block an attack. Since it's usually zoomed in quite close, the camera can jump around pretty fast, especially during some boss fights. If you happen to try your parry right before or after the camera moves, you might not press the right direction and get punished as a result. After the Metal Gear Ray fight, the boss fights focus more on small one-to-one -one battles with opponents that have similar skill sets to Raiden. The first one is LQ84I, or as he comes to be known, Wolf. He represents a fairly big jump in difficulty because this is the point where players are expected to learn the parry system. Apart from that, he's probably the most straightforward boss of the lot. The very fact that Raiden is able to have a conversation with him shows what a step forward Rising is in terms of technology for the series. MGS4 was a world on the cusp of ditching soldiers like Solid Snake in favour of AIs and cybernetic enhancements. Rising is that concept taken into its next stage. Even the basic soldiers are now cyborgs. Before having played the game, I was worried about how Revengeance would continue the world of Metal Gear Solid, but it does so excellently, particularly because these changes were brought up in MGS4 first, making for a smooth transition. It's a world where a soldier like Snake, with relatively few man-made enhancements, would be carved apart by any of the bosses. The second boss, Mistral, is the first real Winds of Destruction member that Raiden comes across. Bosses are a more natural fit in an action game than they ever were in a stealth game, but the reduced emphasis on story does make them a bit less interesting than they could have been. Mistral and Monsoon are hit the hardest, only being introduced at the beginning of their fight, giving us no time to learn what they're about before being forced to slice them up. I don't really mind this though, the story in the Solid games intrudes on the gameplay more than enough as is. What bugs me more about Mistral is the way her over-the-top design has no impact on her fight at all. I don't think I ever saw her accomplish anything with 10 arms that she couldn't have done with 2. I mean, I can understand the use in having maybe 2 extra pairs, but it looks like they just went overboard to give her a unique visual design. I'm assuming there was some sort of underlying idea here they wanted to execute for Mistral, and maybe they were ultimately unable to. It's still an okay fight, but kind of forgettable in comparison to the others. In between missions, the player is given the ability to purchase upgrades, which are about what you'd expect. Health, energy and damage boosts are available alongside new moves. The new moves unfortunately don't play as much of a role as they ideally should, partly because basic combos will suffice for any enemy or boss, and it's impossible to tell which combo does more damage anyway. Stringing together moves basically boils down to pressing square and triangle as much as you want. Thanks to some nice animations which give the attacks just the right amount of weight, the combat is still very satisfying, but the use of only two buttons for attacks is very limiting. If you ask me, one of the top priorities for an action game like this is to make sure the button layout is perfect. That's why I was puzzled to see the circle button get wasted as an action button, which is only used for stealth assassinations or making Raiden interact with a few panels on the walls. There's no reason these couldn't have been mapped as context-sensitive actions for one of the other face buttons. Or, to put it another way, there's no reason the circle button shouldn't have also been used for combat as well. Even if Platinum didn't want to expand the complexity of the combat with more moves, this extra button could have been used as a dedicated launcher or an easier way to perform a dodge. With easier ways to perform these actions, they could have become more integral parts of the player's moveset. Another button mapping issue arises in Blade Mode, where the left analog stick positions the cut and the right analog stick decides the angle. Hammering the square or triangle button to make rapid cuts is fine, but the way precise cuts are handled leaves a little something to be desired. Rather than allowing the player to position the two sticks and then press the R1 button to make the slice, the player has to release the right analog stick and allow it to snap back into its original position, 
This isn't an issue for much of the game, but the final boss on hard difficulty gave me some trouble with this because the stick wouldn't snap back at the exact angle I wanted. Now this may totally be the fault of the controller, and like I said, most cuts in the game don't require this level of precision, but it highlights a problem that has no reason to exist. The next act after Mistral is probably the most story focused of any of them and lacks a boss fight at the end. Raiden goes in search of a research facility that's been trafficking children. Wolf returns here, this time on Raiden's side, and he's a surprisingly enjoyable character. I like how he's very much a serious AI throughout the whole game. It would have been very easy to just write him in a more human way to make him more likeable. Raiden frees Wolf from his previous shackles that constrained Wolf from acting on his own desires or thinking for himself. It's a bit of a bizarre decision for a man who's been toyed with by an AI to a huge extent in the past, but in the end maybe that's the reason why. Maybe he wants to prove to himself that AIs can still be valuable despite the problems they've raised in the past. Another new character is George, who arrives not long into this chapter. Characters who serve as an exaggerated comic relief are a real gamble, but George paid off for me. I wanted to dislike him as soon as he started speaking, but somehow it didn't take long for him to win me over and make me laugh. At the same time, I can clearly see he's a gamble which didn't pay off for a lot of people. He must be an extremely polarizing character. If I had played Revengeance for the first time on a bad day, I could easily see myself being irritated with him rather than amused. Either way, I think his script deserves some praise, if only for the dedication that's gone into it. Oh, maybe live on the street, they can skip for a bob, nah? Then this good knee dressed like the mafia say, Hey, boy, you want a job? What the worst gonna happen, nah? What that mother scum don't put me on a rass boat? They pack us all a pickable dirty container, next thing we know, we're here, at that jumbie lab. I'm not sure if this is anything close to an accurate portrayal of slang spoken anywhere in the world, but that's besides the point. It sounds consistent, and as far as joke characters go, you could do a lot worse. MGS4 proved that beyond a shadow of a doubt. The Mastiff enemies which roam the sewers tend to be a fairly annoying enemy to fight thanks to their ability to grab the player and their large amount of health compared to many other common foes. This encourages more stealth usage during this chapter, and the support team push Raiden towards using more discretion rather than going in swords blazing. Being a Metal Gear title, there was bound to be some vestigial elements of Solid in Rising, and it shows when characters get on the codec to express disappointment if the player opts not to use stealth during certain sections. I'm just speculating, but it's so out of place in an over-the-top action title like this that I feel as though Platinum Games were probably asked by Kojima to make this little concession, and felt they couldn't say no. Even worse is the inclusion of the alert noise when Raiden is seen. Metal Gear players have been conditioned to associate this noise with failure. Sometimes a player will be attempting a stealthy approach and fail. In those cases, the noise would make sense. But every Revengeance player should just be able to go pure action without feeling guilted into a playstyle they didn't sign up for. Don't get me wrong, the stealth approach is a nice option, but this is MGR, not MGS. I found the Japanese garden section later on was a better and more subtle way of encouraging players to act like a ninja rather than a butcher, and thankfully by that point the characters seem to give up lecturing Raiden for getting caught. The menu is another thing which adheres too strictly to the Metal Gear Solid way of doing things. There's no way to swap weapons or items without pausing the action completely, breaking the flow. If you ask me, on-the-fly weapon switching is the easiest and most sensible way to add some more depth to the combat in a game like this, as has been shown by other titles in the past, so it's a shame to see Revengeance take a step backwards here. Even using the regular, non-combat essential items feels rather clunky. Thankfully, apart from a few helicopters, every enemy can be tackled fairly comfortably with the basic sword. A reliance on other weapons would have crippled the game considering how clunky the menu is. The Mastiffs also highlight another problem with Revengeance, the stick waggling. Unless the player can avoid almost every attack in the game, there will inevitably be points where Raiden gets stunned and the player has to wiggle the left thumbstick to snap him out of it. I understand they wanted to punish players who happen to take several hits in quick succession, but it gets frustrating fast. Particularly against the Mastiffs or Dwarf Gecko who can both stun Raiden and grapple him, greatly increasing the chances of this happening, and sometimes causing it to happen several times in succession. I think instead Raiden should have been knocked to the ground with some extra damage only to rebound fairly quickly. Punish players, but don't take them out of the action. In the research facility, the plot of Revengeance takes a dark turn when it becomes apparent the bad guys have been cutting out the brains of impoverished children to turn them into cyborg soldiers. It's a logical extension of the story of MGS2. If Raiden had been born a few years later, he would have been one of those brains in a jar. If there's one thing I really like about the story of Revengeance, it's the way it takes a familiar Metal Gear theme of technology gone too far and pushes it to even darker places than before. The further the series moves into the future, the less human it becomes.
This eventually takes a toll on Raiden in the next chapter though, in a sequence led by Sam where Raiden starts to hear the thoughts of his enemies. Ever since MGS2, Metal Gear games always allowed players the option to use non-lethal combat methods, but Revengeance ditches this choice and if anything it glorifies violence. It would have betrayed the series' ideals a bit too hard to go through the whole game without at least commenting on this disparity between Revengeance and the rest of the series, so it takes an opportunity to do so here. This scene probably could have had a bit more gravitas, but killing enemies as their suppressed fears play out in the background can be surprisingly uncomfortable. Unfortunately, this leads into the most disappointing scene in the game where Raiden takes on the persona of Jack the Ripper. Although Quentin Flynn overall puts in a pretty good performance as Raiden in this game, any scene where he has to fake this voice just comes off feeling incredibly forced. Now you're just being nasty. <laughs> In MGS2, it was near the end that they revealed Raiden had been a child soldier, and some people had named him Jack the Ripper. Now, perhaps I overlooked something, but I never got the impression from the previous games that Jack the Ripper was ever an alter ego for Raiden. It was just a name people had used to refer to him since he had been ruthless on the battlefield. This strange side to Raiden is used to justify the Ripper mode, which cuts most enemies apart instantly. It's a fairly shallow gameplay mechanic, acting mostly as a lifesaver should the player feel overwhelmed, and it comes about halfway through the game, probably at the point when most players have lost any need for it. As such, it's not something I feel was worth torpedoing Raiden's character for, especially since they could have easily made some other excuse for it. The scene where Jack the Ripper first surfaces comes immediately after the incident with Sam. If I believed the story of Revengeance had as much going on as an average Metal Gear, I would say this scene is just a point where Raiden snaps due to guilt. Instead of reverting to an old persona, he's actually creating a brand new one based on how other people see him to disassociate himself from the killing he's done. Since the plot of Revengeance takes a clear backseat to the gameplay, I'm not sure if this interpretation is intentional or if I'm just reading too much into things. Whatever the case, it lines up more with my idea of Raiden, a character who has always felt as though he's not quite capable of dealing with the emotional toll of being a super soldier. Snake was who we wanted to be, Raiden is who we really are. As I said earlier, Monsoon gets the shaft in comparison to the other bosses since he pops up right before his fight. His gimmick is perhaps the most imaginative enemy design in the game, however. Players spend the whole game cutting stuff up, so having an enemy break apart is a genius move. The Monsoon battle is thoroughly enjoyable. The rapid fire countering required during the smoke bomb sequences once again pushes the difficulty forward, and it's extremely satisfying to see Raiden parry every attack in a long sequence once you get the hang of it. That's Revengeance's gameplay in a nutshell. When it goes badly, it can often feel more frustrating than it needed to be, but when it goes right, it feels very, very good. The blade mode mechanic is the same way. Most of the time it feels fantastic to slice apart enemies, but cutting other objects can be more of a mixed bag. Objects will fall apart roughly the right way, but this often blocks Raiden from getting through as easily as he should be able to. The chunks that an object forms are like big immovable slabs that fall over each other. They collide with Raiden, but they barely respond to him unless he cuts them up even further. It's particularly noticeable if the player cuts a fence while doing a ninja run. The logical choice here is to force the object to cave in away from the player, so the ninja run momentum will carry them through. But instead, this sometimes brings Raiden to a dead stop. It's only a small thing, but what should make the player feel like a badass cyborg ninja capable of destroying any obstacles sometimes backfires and makes Raiden seem clumsy and immobile. The events continue to play themselves out in Denver, inside the World Marshal building and later as Raiden leaves the city. At times these areas can underscore how graphically unimpressive Revengeance is. The city lacks any semblance of life, and even if you ignore the lack of people, the level of detail is fairly sparse. Now this isn't to say Revengeance is a terrible looking game or anything, but MGS4 was a very graphically impressive game, which outclasses Revengeance despite being released several years earlier. This all comes down to frame rate. Revengeance runs at a solid 60 frames per second, while MGS4 ran at 30. Doubling the number of frames on the same hardware requires quite a sacrifice in other areas. It's a shame Revengeance sometimes looks shoddy in comparison to MGS4, but it was absolutely the right decision to focus on a crisp frame rate above all else in an action title like this. The higher the frame rate, the sooner a player can react to any given threat, and the more responsive the controls are going to feel. Revengeance really benefits from its frame rate, and I have to give Platinum points for prioritising this over the graphics, because the truth is a focus on better graphics probably would have bagged them more sales despite the game being worse as a result. Shiny graphics get players and critics making positive comments, whereas the frame rate of a game is often overlooked unless it dips below 30 frames a second. I think it's between the Monsoon and Sundowner fights where it becomes clear that bosses are the greatest asset Revengeance has. 
The smooth, unrelenting gameplay is certainly enjoyable, but after a while the engagements can start to blur together. The Devil May Cry series cleverly encouraged players to mix up their attack patterns with the inclusion of a style meter. In fact, that was one of the most interesting, and I dare say innovative aspects of the original Devil May Cry. It wasn't simply about being competent at combat, it was also about how cool you could look while you were doing it. I understand why this doesn't exist in Revengeance since Raiden is simply a rogue mercenary who wants to get the job done, but it's a shame there's not a similar incentive to try out new skills in this game. Thankfully, even without this incentive, Revengeance is extremely good at making the player feel like an incredible cyborg ninja. The combat is rewarding in and of itself despite its repetitive nature. Quick time events are one of the few ways some of the enemies feel distinct from one another. I wouldn't say these are overused considering how much action there is in Revengeance, but I think there was potential to integrate them a lot better. Enemies flash with a red light when Raiden will need to counter, and they flash yellow when Raiden should dodge. I might be in the minority on this one, and it would certainly increase the difficulty of the game for anyone with a bad memory, but I would have preferred if enemies had more colours to indicate other actions the player should perform, instead of showing the button prompt directly. For example, instead of showing the controls for a ninja run on screen, an enemy would just flash blue and the player would know to ninja run. A green flash might indicate that it's time to mash an attack button or wiggle the analogue stick. I'm not even proposing any other changes to the way this stuff works, I just think finding a way to remove button icons from the screen would make players feel more directly involved in the actions Raiden is performing. I feel like this would have tied the action together a bit more and could have been a way to differentiate the enemy encounters a bit better as well. Even so, the quick time events and blade mode are often used to good effect, particularly during the boss fights. The final sequence for Sundowner, where Raiden flies back up the building to slice Sundowner apart in mid-air is incredibly satisfying. Obviously this can vary from person to person, but I feel like Sundowner and Mistral run against the grain somewhat when compared to the other bosses. Mistral's fight only asks that the player parry about as much as the earlier wolf fight, but it's also littered with Dwarf Gecko, who drop an ample amount of health packs. After Wolf, the next major increase in difficulty doesn't come until Monsoon forces the player to constantly parry a rapid succession of attacks. In comparison, Sundowner does nothing to raise the stakes any higher. Speaking purely from a gameplay standpoint, the first boss probably should have been Mistral, followed by Wolf without any backup enemies to restore Raiden's health, then Sundowner, followed by Monsoon. Again, this might vary more from person to person than I've realised, but it seems to me like that would make for a smoother difficulty curve than the one present at the moment. Despite the dip in difficulty, the presentation of the Sundowner fight is as good as anything else in the game, which is saying a lot because the presentation of the whole game is fantastic. When the slick animations and scripted sequences combine with the combat, music and bosses, it can lead Revengeance to some dizzying heights. These are the times when Revengeance becomes greater than the sum of its parts, and I'd say those alone are worth playing the game for. The downside is, despite its short length, it can't manage to sustain that level of quality for its whole duration. There's a bunch of VR missions available to make up for the short runtime of the main game, but they're a mixed bag. VR missions are short chunks of gameplay that should ideally encourage the player to try them repeatedly, until they've mastered the core mechanics involved in that particular mission and gotten a decent score. That means a lot of failures and restarts along the way, but Revengeance cripples its VR missions by focusing on a fancy looking UI instead of functionality. When restarting a mission a player is put through a loading screen and then, once the level loads, they're put through a fake, unskippable loading screen about as long as the real one. In a VR mission like this, which might need many retries before getting a good result, a player should be able to play a level the second it's reloaded, not five seconds later. It's bad enough to have a loading screen here at all, let alone a fake one placed after it. If you complete a mission successfully, you're also booted out into the menu, which then loads all of its icons individually. Again, if the menu is ready to be shown, show it. The animation looked nice the first time I saw it, but it quickly became grating. The content of the VR missions themselves is fine, but the menus really stopped me from enjoying them. At this point, the main game has only two chapters left, and Sam's one just launches straight into a boss fight with him and ends immediately afterwards. I wonder if this was always the case, it feels like the team had to cut a few levels towards the end. Whatever the reasons for this, I actually like the way the pacing changes after the halfway mark. As I said before, I think boss fights are the biggest assets of Revengeance, and the game starts throwing them at the player faster and faster right the way through to the end. Since Sam most closely matches Raiden's fighting style, there's not a lot can be said about this fight. Mechanically, it's one of the most vanilla matchups in the game, but thanks to some great presentation and good balancing, it feels like a climactic moment. Sam is built up from the start to be Raiden's rival, the samurai to match Raiden's ninja. 
this fight is the beginning of the end, and the setting, a deserted highway at sunset, is perfect for a showdown between the two rivals. Revengeance waits until pretty late into its narrative before it goes for the inevitable cameo appearance in the form of Sunny. Of all the characters they could have used, she's a pretty good fit, since she's been linked with Raiden from very early on in his story. Her over-the-top intelligence is taken to even further heights here. She's about 14 years old and seems to be running an aeronautics company. I think it's for the best that Revengeance largely forgoes the characters from the previous games, mainly because MGS4 provided a sense of closure, but also because Revengeance turns absolutely everything up to 11. It needed to feel like its own thing compared to Metal Gear Solid. Thankfully the Sunny cameo isn't enough to pull Revengeance back under the shadow of the Solid games, but it does feel highly unnecessary. I don't want to go too far into the story of this game since it clearly wasn't the focus, but I will say the dialogue often feels more crisp and natural than most solid installments in the series. I wasn't surprised to see it was written by the same person who did much of the codec and briefing file dialogue for Peace Walker. Since the story is lighter, only a few characters other than Raiden stand out. Wolf, Sam and Armstrong being the three that get the most focus. Wolf's arc plays itself out very well, and he gives the game a voice to wax philosophical from time to time without it feeling forced. Sam is a bit of an enigma, but I suppose he represents a samurai fairly well. He works for those in power, and has a sense of honour in battle even if he's also a bit of a killing machine. Armstrong steals the show in the end though, he's just the most insane, pitch-perfect villain a game like Revengeance could ask for, rooted just enough in reality to make him compelling, while simultaneously being the most insane of them all. The ending sequence between Raiden and Armstrong is so memorable that it's easy to forget about the Metal Gear fight which happens just before it. I'm glad the team went to the effort to put Metal Gear Excelsius together, but I feel like it pales in comparison to the Ray fight from the start, probably due to its lack of mobility. I also think its design is a bit strange, it looks more like something you'd see in Peace Walker rather than Revengeance. It's as though they simply used the last Metal Gear game for reference rather than trying to create a successor to Metal Gear Ray. Revengeance doesn't have an amazing plot by any standards, but it ends up coming together in a very satisfying way. First of all, it establishes Armstrong as an extremely powerful enemy by bringing Raiden down to 0.1% health and keeping Armstrong at over 90. Right when Raiden is on the brink, Wolf and Sam save the day at the last moment with Sam's sword, and finally Armstrong attacks Wolf, the player's loyal companion, establishing some hatred for him. In fact, it's not dissimilar to the way Metal Gear Solid 1 plays out in its final moments. As I said, it's not groundbreaking, but it didn't need to be. The story is the excuse for the action, not the other way around, and it does a pitch-perfect job of getting the player invested in its final battle. The Armstrong battle deserves to be applauded for what a great climax it is, so I'd like to point out some of the little things they got right during this fight. First and most obvious, Armstrong is the only boss in the game to have 200% health, and this matches the maximum amount of health that Raiden can have. Armstrong has the most quick time events where the player can do a lot of damage, so even though a player might remove 100 of Armstrong's health with scripted sequences, in their head as soon as they see 200%, they equate Armstrong to be roughly double the power of the previous bosses. The quick time events are excellently animated, and even something as simple as the way Armstrong's health bar depletes while these play out can make a player feel triumphant. Removing Raiden's weapon serves a dramatic purpose, but also has a hand in improving this battle. Since the player is forced to use Sam's sword, the designers could precisely balance the amount of damage that could be done to Armstrong. There's no cheap way to take him down. All of the player's skills are tested during this fight, and even parrying is made more difficult, because Armstrong's animations often have a large delay on them compared to other enemies in the game. At the start of this video I mentioned how much I loved the soundtrack to Revengeance, and I want to stress again that I think the soundtrack during the boss fights was phenomenal. The way the music amps up in intensity over the course of each fight adds a lot to them, but Armstrong's battle plays against this in a subtle and clever way. The music for Armstrong's fight starts out at its highest intensity, and stays that way for the whole thing. It gives the impression that the game has reached its pinnacle, it can't go any higher than this. The only complaint I have about this fight is the way some of Armstrong's move clash with the camera. It can be hard to avoid the flame attacks because the view is pulled in unnecessarily close to Raiden a lot of the time. With that little caveat out of the way, I think I can firmly say that Revengeance ends as strong as it starts. It goes out with a bang, and ripping out Armstrong's heart in a familiar way to most enemies is the icing on the cake. The narrative wraps up surprisingly quickly afterwards, and leaves Raiden open for a sequel. The whole game runs against the ending to MGS4 already, since Raiden was supposed to give up battle, 
I'm glad to see they're at least being honest about it this time, and the next time Raiden comes back it might not feel quite so forced. That concludes Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. In many ways it feels to me like one of the most old school, big budget releases in a while. It rarely deviates from its tight core gameplay, and it doesn't hold the player's hand too much. The soundtrack is a big part of the experience as well, and the boss fights are given a great deal of focus. It can initially start out frustrating, but like any old school game, the fun comes more with the mastery of the game's mechanics. Once I was over the initial difficulty hump, I had an absolute blast playing Revengeance despite a few glaring flaws. It's not the greatest action game ever made, but considering how easily it could have felt like a crappy spin-off, I was surprised by its quality. Forgive me for the pun, but I have to say it's a very solid game, worthy at least of wearing its Metal Gear title. It starts strong, ends strong, and dips a little in the middle. What it lacks in complexity, it makes up for with its slick presentation and amazing boss fights. It's short, but at least it doesn't wear out its welcome, and as such it's pretty satisfying to go back and play again. Revengeance hits a few peaks where it's amazing, but a lot of the time it also slips into mediocrity. Often I felt the game just needed one more missing ingredient to really shine, for example dynamic weapon switching. The end result left me wanting more in both a good and bad way, as though Platinum had managed to make the cut, but never quite ripped out the juicy goods buried inside. This is what has me excited for the idea of a sequel though. If Platinum can take Revengeance, use it as a base, and expand on it in a couple of meaningful ways, then a new Rising game could be something very, very special.